Profit First in a Contingency Firm with Brandon Osterbind, episode 116. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit with Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10x effect, Moshe Amsel. Well, hello and welcome to another great interview episode of the Profit with Law podcast. I'm your host, Moshe Amsel, and today I'm joined with a wonderful and amazing guest who I came across somewhere in a Facebook conversation where we were talking about the financials of a firm. And uh, what happened was uh, somebody commented about uh, not being able to use profit, profit First, a system, a cash management system that I talk about a lot uh, as a Profit First professional. As a matter of fact, uh, we have two episodes dedicated to Profit First here on the podcast, and I'm pulling up my phone right now to look up what those episode numbers are. I believe they're 16 and 18. Uh, I'll get back to you on that in just a moment as to which ones uh, they are, but Profit First is a cash management system that I I believe is extremely helpful for um, for firm owners to implement and get a handle on their cash flow and also uh, increase their profitability. So yes, it is episode sixteen is take your profit first, and episode eighteen is profit first step by step. We'll link those up in the show notes for you. And uh, you can just click on those and go back and listen to them. Uh, they were produced quite a while ago. Um, we're, we're up in the uh, 90s and 100s as far as episode numbers go. So uh, I'm not sure when this interview will be released. So I don't know if we've crossed that 100 mark yet. But the time that we're recording this, we have 91 episodes uh, published. So it's it's going it's going a little back and maybe it's time to revisit that conversation which is a great opportunity that we're going to take today to do just exactly that but what was interesting is is that somebody commented and said well you can't really uh use profit first in a contingency practice and i think in that same conversation if i if my memory serves me correctly somebody was was asking about implementing profit first in a firm when they're first starting and it was you know that's the conversation went down that road of, well, you can't use profit first unless there's profit to be had. And our guest today, Brandon Osterbind from Osterbind Law, he's a founding partner there, chimed in and said, hey, we're using profit first. We're a contingency practice and it's, you know, things haven't been better from that. And I said, hey, (laughs) we need to talk. Let's get you over here onto the podcast. So Brandon was kind enough to uh, agree to come on the show. And that's what that's that's what we're going to be discussing today. So Brandon, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, so Brandon, I always love to get the first thing is for our guests to learn a little bit about you. And I'm sure that you, you have a story, you know, of how you got to where you are. How'd you get into law? How'd you get into a contingency practice? Um, and, and how did you navigate the financial, uh, pieces of that? It's a lot of questions. Uh, so don't go into too much of the detail yet, but just give us the, the, broad strokes of how you got to where you are today. And then we'll go back and pick up the pieces and ask you more questions about the details. Sure. Well, I I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer probably in high school uh, and everything I did uh, in college uh, leading up to law school was directed towards that. Had a lot of uh, really awesome mentors during that time who helped guide me uh, into law school. And I, I graduated law school in 2008, probably the worst time you can graduate law school, except for maybe right now, um, when there were virtually no jobs. I was fortunate um, to get a clerkship on the Virginia Court of Appeals. I worked for two years doing that. And then I started working at a small uh, four-person law firm in Central Virginia doing a general practice. Um, So I, I did everything from wills 
which we did on a flat fee basis to um, civil litigation, which we uh, built hourly to personal injury. We did contingency. I did criminal defense. I did domestic work. I did everything. I started off doing every single thing that came through the door. Um, and then I guess by a stroke of fortuity and maybe a little bit of intentionality, I, I started uh, realizing that I really liked the personal injury work and the contingency work a lot better than I did the domestic work, the criminal defense work, the state planning work. I just didn't really enjoy that sort of thing. So I just, I just decided to stop doing it. And I stop, started saying no to all the other cases that were coming through. Um, and as a result, I, I got to a place where I was pretty much only doing contingency work, uh, personal injury cases, workers' comp cases, uh, med mal cases, and uh, risk of disability cases, and, and things like that. Um, and a couple years ago, probably three years ago, my wife and I decided, my wife who's also an attorney, uh, decided that we were going to start our own law firm. Uh, so that's what we did um, in June of uh, 2017. And I didn't realize uh, that the Profit First system existed until um, about a year ago when I, when I read the book over uh, summer vacation. And then I finally got off my hands and implemented it um, in the last quarter of 2019. Awesome. Uh, so when you and your wife set out to start your practice, one of the things... Um, one of the challenges out there is when you're doing contingency work is there's a time frame from when you start getting cases until you work them through to the point where there's a payout. And, you know, so you have to go a period of time without earning any money. Uh, how did you plan for that? How did you how did you navigate that going into it? Well, I guess at some point, um, probably six years ago, 2014 or so, we, um, you know, Mike McCallowitz talks about uh, Dave Ramsey and his book. Um, and we first started working with uh, the Ramsey Solutions Group and got out of debt, paid off all the student loans, um, really cut our expenses down uh, to virtually nothing, uh, lived on nothing so that later we can, we can live like no one else, uh, like Dave Ramsey likes to say. And then, uh, so we got out of debt, paid off all the student loans. We st saved up our three to six month emergency fund. We followed all the rules. Um, all, all the way through baby step four, five, six. And um, we just felt like we we're on a, a really good, we we're at a really good place financially. We had money saved up outside of the emergency fund uh, to start the firm. And I, you know, I was fortunate. I had been practicing for many years at that point. I had a, a, a huge book of cases that I already had. Um, and you know, the you know, state bars, they kind of help you out when you, when you leave a firm and you start your own firm, but they also, it, it, they also uh, don't give you a whole lot of direction. So you kind of have to make the decision that you're going to uh, leave your firm and you have to tell your partners that you're leaving before you know if any of your clients are coming with you, at least in the state of Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, because you're not allowed to contact the clients at all until you have at least uh, attempted to confer on a joint communication uh, from the firm about the terms of, of the exit. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of an awkward phase, made the decision to start our firm without knowing if any of our cases would come with us. But we knew that we had money to pay for firm expenses. We knew that we had uh, money to pay for personal expenses. And we knew that we can last um, six months or so without bringing in any money. Fortunately, that didn't happen. After about six months, um, we were paying ourselves a regular salary and um, that all just seemed to work out. And, you know, virtually all of my clients came with me, which is a, a huge boost of confidence there. Um, so it wasn't as much of a delay as you would think, you know, you take a client, you open your doors, you take a client, and then three years later, you get your first payday. Uh, we were making money within the first six months. That's, a, that's awesome. And, and I've, I've heard uh, a number of stories like that. Unfortunately, there's a lot of firm owners who start their firm and don't have a, a similar story to tell uh, where they don't start with a book of business and they're starting from scratch. Uh, but fairly quickly, you say that you were that you were paying yourself. So were you a um, what do we call it? A rainmaker at the other firm? In other words, were, yeah. were, were you were you bringing in the, the business to begin with. Uh, so, so it was not really something new that you had to figure out of how to find, find the, the work uh, once you went on your own. 
Yeah, I was I was pretty much running the marketing at the at the other firm, and um, I had my hands in a lot of other things, and uh, I was pretty active on social media um, before any other attorneys were really active in our area on social media. Now a lot of people are uh, posting about um, legal stuff on social media, but you know, I I would walk out of a hearing and uh, snap a picture outside the courthouse and say I just left a hearing, and then I get fifty likes on a business page, uh, which is you know, just doesn't really happen. You can post a blog post on social media and, and, you know, spend hours writing uh, great content and no one will click on it or like it. But if you post a picture walking out of the courthouse saying, Oh, I just finished up with a hearing, look at me. And then everyone likes it. So, you know, you have to tell people what you do on social media so that they can send you cases. If people don't know what you do, uh, then they're, they're not going to think of you when their friend gets in a car accident or when their friend is injured at work or when their cousin um, gets rear-ended or something like that. So I was pretty active on, on doing all of that, uh, both personally and for the uh, former firm. So it wasn't that difficult for me to transition from the old firm into the new firm um, and to do it at a, 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 with much more freedom in the way that I wanted to do it uh, without input from, from other people. Uh, and, and that has worked out for me, um, exponentially. That's awesome. Uh, so do you have a specific, uh, niche within personal injury that you focus on or you, you pretty much take everything that comes, you know, that, that comes your way when it comes to PI? No, we're, we're, we're pretty picky about the cases that we take. Uh, we, we don't like the smaller value cases because they take just as much effort uh, for, for much less return. So we try to be pretty choosy about the cases that we take um, dollar value wise. You know, but if it comes to you know, a T-bone accident versus a motorcycle accident versus a rear ender, uh, I don't typically distinguish between those. I'll take e- either one of those depending on if it's a good liability case with good damages uh, and good coverage, the trifecta. Right. So, uh, and, and uh, folks, I hope that you're, that you're paying attention to what's going on here because Brandon is sharing with us that he is being selective in analyzing the potential uh, return on investment or return on effort. We would call it ROI, but I think it's more ROE, right? The return on effort of the firm for what the potential is in these in these cases. So if you're if you're in you know a, a contingency or even even if you're your hourly work or or things like that if if you're if you're spending a lot of effort you know setting up a client, you know uh, getting the communication going, uh getting the billing process and collections process going uh and you and and you're and you're doing these tiny micro cases and you're just doing a little bit of work here and a little bit of work there for clients, creating a lot of work for yourself that um, can be much more efficient if you're more selective with what you're doing. Um, what what I'm interested in now in is, Brandon, is, okay, so you're selective with your cases. Did you start that way from day one because uh, you came in with that knowledge or did you figure that out when you started to implement a system to realize that profitability was needed to be improved? I think I, I kind of gradually fell into that mindset. Uh, it certainly wasn't something that I started with. Um, it, it probably wasn't until about maybe two years ago, maybe a year after owning my own firm, uh, that we finally decided to start saying no to certain cases, you know, because when we first started, we were taking whatever came in. If it was a ten, fifteen thousand dollars case, we'd take it, we'd go to a small claims court, try it and, and get our $5,000 fee. Uh, but what I, what I realized is, you know, you can get uh, 10, $10,000 cases and put in 10 times the amount of effort and you can get $100,000 case and have the same exact result. Um, so we just started probably about two years ago saying no to those cases that we felt like, um, you know, the client can probably resolve that case on their own um, with the same net result without us getting involved. And usually when attorneys get involved in these cases, it takes longer for um, the case to resolve. The insurance companies dig their heels in more. The attorneys on the other side are billing. um, They're probably billing a flat rate just to go to small claims court. They're not billing by the hour. So it doesn't cost the insurance company that much more to go try it. Um, And you end up spending six, eight, nine months um, going through the whole process. And the client probably could have done just as much or better net 
um, than if they hired me to begin with. So I started telling people um, how to how to resolve those cases for a net gain themselves. But when you get over a certain value, you really need an attorney to uh, amplify that value, to increase the size of your pie, not just take a slice of it. Now, do you pretty pretty regularly have those types of people coming through the door where you're just basically telling them, look, it, do- it doesn't make sense for us to do this for you? Yeah, maybe two or three times a month, um, I'll have those those cases come in where it just doesn't make sense for us to get involved. Uh, we've got a pretty decent screening process now where our um, intake person will ask a series of questions uh, and we'll, we'll prepare, uh, do an intake form that gets submitted through our case management system. So we'll know a lot about the case before we ever sit down with the person. A lot of times we'll know even before we sit down what we're going to tell them to do and whether it'd be a good case for us. So I, I am actually going to give you an idea here you may not have thought about. Um, so one of the things that I, that I teach is uh, that not everything that you sell needs to be the work that you do. Uh, when you look at your clients and, and potential clients, your client journey, who you're attracting into your firm, there may be other opportunities there. This is uh, uh, jumping out at me that, hey, there's an opportunity here. Uh, when you have somebody that comes in and you're basically telling them, look, you can really do this yourself. You don't need me. Uh, there's an opportunity there to create a piece of education. So like a course that teaches them how to do this themselves and how to navigate that and sell that to them. You know, so you can sell that to them for a thousand bucks. They take your course, they go do it themselves. They have a great, a, you know, a great outcome. They still became a client, but in a different way. You, you, you're not, you're not sending the leads that are coming in the door away for, for no value. It, it, you know, you're, you're providing value. You're telling them go do it yourself. You're probably even giving them some guidance along the way, but you're getting nothing for it. You know, you can turn that into a product and sell it. Yeah, that's that's a great idea. And actually, I've I've got a, a course just like that in process. I've been thinking a lot about that um, because I, I agree that that we can still make money and provide value to people uh, at the same time, but I don't have to necessarily do the work and represent them. That's that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, this, it, I'm not sure the timing of this of this episode, but we are going to be ha- having a one day summit, a one day uh, workshop. It's actually not going to be a workshop. It's going to be a, a, a one-day summit. So we're, we're, uh, our brand, we, we launched the Law Firm Growth Summit at the end of last year. And we decided on the backs of that, it was a five-day event with 30 speakers, that we want to create some one-day events that are very specific to very specific topics. Uh, so if we're ready to promote this by the time that this episode goes live, if this is not planned at all, um, the, the one day event that we're going to be doing in June, uh, and I don't have the date yet as we're talking is, um, is going to be exactly this, how to navigate, um, in implementing information products into your firm. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a passionate, uh, mission that I'm on to try to start to change the way that attorneys think of their business to uh, to start to look for these other opportunities and not, and not think that there's a simple yes or no. This is a client for me. This is not a client for me because there's so many different ways to serve people. Uh, so we're going to be going deep into that world of of creating information products and how to position it and how to sell it. And uh, we're going to do a full day event on that. So uh, really interesting that this conversation <laughs> went and touched on that. But yeah, when you start to, to, to see that, um, that opportunity, when you start to recognize it, uh, it's suddenly like this light bulb moment. And it could be, you know, you have three or four of those a month coming in and you do nothing other than that initial consultation. It's not even you doing the consultation and somebody on your staff turns around and says, hey, look, this is, you know, we're not going to end up taking your case. It's too small. It doesn't make sense. You can get a, uh, the same outcome. Uh, all you need to do is is understand how to navigate the court system. And the good news is, is we've created a, a training program for that. You know, it'll take you five hours to go through it, and it's just going to cost you a thousand bucks to buy it. You want to buy it today, and, and you know, then you're you're all set. And there's, I mean, you'll get you'll you'll you'll, you'll, you'll three four thousand dollars a month now that you're going to get for doing something once and never you know never doing anything again except for maybe maintaining it. Um, right. So, and the other thing is, is you you know you you're a Dave Ramsey um, 
you know, disciple, you're a, you're a Mike McCallowitz disciple, you understand numbers, you understand finances, there's another opportunity on the back end. So if somebody is getting out on the other side, they're getting a payout. What are they going to do with that money? You know, do they, yep. do, do they, do they have questions about that? Is that something that you can help give them some guidance on and create another product on the back end of that where you either sell them or you provide a subscription of some kind or you partner with somebody who's, who that's their expertise and you funnel them into that person's world. So just, you know, those are things that, that you can start to think of um, in that process. But I don't want to get too far away from the topic that <laughs> that I'm hoping to, to get to. So I want to jump back into this conversation of, OK, you've been on this great journey. You've you're, you're attracting these cases. You figure out that you need to be smart about which cases you say yes to and which ones you, you, you say no to. When you decided to implement Profit First, when you discovered it, did you were you actually finding that you were not doing things correctly in your firm? You were running into problems, and if yes, what were those problems? What what were the symptoms that that Profit First solved for you? So I have to uh, back up and, and admit that I did not find Profit First. My wife did, um, and she is a, a voracious reader, and I I try to keep up. So I finally read the book probably after six months uh, of her telling me that I need to read the read the book. Um, and in 2019, we were getting a good deal of cases. We were, we were doing a lot of uh, good things, um, but we had some staffing issues where things weren't, get, weren't getting scheduled in time. Um, it, the, you know, trials weren't getting scheduled. Depositions weren't getting scheduled. We had a lot of turnover um, with our paralegals around that time. Um, and so we did see a pretty significant slowdown in revenue, uh, particularly over the summer of 2019. Um, so it was during the summer of 2019 that I, I sat down and finally read that book and I realized, um, you know, it shouldn't be as difficult as it is. There, there's a much better way. Uh, but, you know, I had, I had always been kind of um, ignorant about, you know, when should I pay myself this or when should I uh, take money out of the company? Uh, is it a good time now or will I need that money in, in three, four months? And this whole system kind of answered all those questions. It just, it, it provides a process that if you follow it, you don't really have to wonder those things anymore. And that's what really appealed to me. That's what appeals to me about the uh, Dave Ramsey baby steps too. It's, you know, if, if there's a, a dispute in my household about, you know, should we do this or should we do that? The question is, what, what would Dave say? Um, right. And then the question is answered and that's what we do. Um, and of course, if you have a question, you can call Dave uh, and, and get your questions answered directly from him on his radio <laughs> show, exactly which I listen live. to all the time. Um, and, and he can call you out and call you stupid and all the fun things. But um, I've, I've done all those stupid things. And I, I did some of them in the business and I spent too much money. And, you know, the whole eating off of smaller plates really appealed to me because when I see a lot of money, um, I can figure out ways to spend that money. I am the spender in the family. I am the spender in the firm. I'm not a natural saver. That's a muscle that I have to exercise. And if you don't exercise that muscle, you just, you're just very weak at it. And I, and I was very weak at it. So we found ourselves in summer of 2019 um, with uh, little revenue coming in and um, a lot of expenses. Uh, so after I, I read this book, I made a lot of changes um, in our expense side, but I also started to see when we made some personnel changes, um, the revenue side shot up dramatically um, and pretty much saved our year in the last quarter. Um, and then the first quarter of, of um, this year has been um, just as incredible. So uh, a lot of the things that we put into, into place last year, last summer in the third quarter and started paying off in the fourth quarter and then the first quarter of uh, 2020. That's awesome. And I, I don't know if you realize if you made the correlation, but the reason why you love Profit First as a Dave Ramsey person is because the profit first system is simply grandma's envelope system for businesses. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, and that's, you know, that that's how, what Dave cheat teaches. He's like, you know, every dollar has got a name and, and, you know, and you gotta, you gotta account for it before it comes in, uh, which is kind of what you're doing with, with profit first. 
Um, and there's accountants who push back on profit first because they're, you know, they, they think that intuitively people should be doing that anyway. Uh, but, but it's not the case. And, and the reality is, is human nature is very, very different than, than the way accountants think. Otherwise everybody would be accountants. So, uh, and there's a lot of accountants who can't figure out how to run a profitable business either. So, uh, you know, even, even those, you know, the naysayers are, are, are not necessarily any better off. Um, I love this the system, and I love that the the fact that you that you implemented it. So I do want to go into you know just some some detail of how you're navigating the the. I guess once you have a a, a flow of cases completing on a regular basis, your 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 firm doesn't look so much like a contingency firm as far as cash flow goes, right? So so if you're if you're kind of inserting profit first into into the mix when everything is working beautifully, um, it's a very easy question to answer. But how do you navigate when you're in maybe in, in those times that the revenue is lower than normal? You know, are, do you have a drip account set up for that? Um, and folks, a drip account is just what it's labeled in the book where you're saving money in an account to, to, you know, to overcome peaks and valleys that happen in your business. Cause it's not just contingency businesses that have that problem. That's practically every business under the sun has bu busy seasons and, and lighter seasons. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll let, let you try to answer that question. So, so I don't consider myself an advanced profit first user yet. Um, you know, I, I've, you know, I read about all those other accounts, the drip accounts, the vault and all that stuff. Um, and I, I haven't gotten there yet. I've, I've only been doing it for about a, a what, two quarters fully. So um, six months. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I've done is I've cut my expenses drastically. You know, at one point, I think it was costing us about $35,000 a month to run our small firm. And that included me getting paid. Um, and now I've, I've dropped it down to about $20,000 a month uh, to run the firm. So it cut the expenses dramatically. Um, and even with a, 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 a contingency practice that's running, um, you know, we're just a small firm. We have one associate, a paralegal, and a settlement manager who's a retired insurance adjuster. And we all work on the same cases pretty much. Um, so we still have months where you know we'll bring in ten thousand uh, dollars but then we'll have months where we'll bring in sixty seventy thousand um, dollars and what we do is we just follow the principle we put the money into the income account um, and we do our allocations on the first and the 15th of every month and we pay our bills on the first and 15th of every month and just set that rhythm uh, that he talks about uh, because it, it just makes things that much more um, efficient and I, I made a variation um, just because of, of the type of practice that we have. We, we typically advance costs for these cases. So a, a typical personal injury case could cost anywhere from five to $25,000 to try it, depending on how complicated it is, how many experts there are, um, and that sort of thing. So we, we have a cost advance account that we uh, funded once um, and then we just every time we recover costs when we, resol when we resolve a case it just goes automatically back into that account um, kind of the same way though we put all the money back into the income account and then when the time comes to do that allocation i go back and i look well, what, how much of that was cost uh, recovered and i just drop that into the cost advance account that way i never have to ask the question do i have the money to pay this expert this month uh, because the money is just kind of sitting over there in that account and it's ready to be used when it's needed. Um, so, so I, I don't have a drip account. I just keep the money in the operating account, but I'm, I'm really focused on um, budgeting and reducing the cost um, that we, we need to run. Got it. So that, that, that makes sense. And, and I think that um, the drip account would, would definitely make sense too, because what's happened is, is you started to pay attention, you know, as Dave says, you're paying <laughs> when you pay attention to it, you know, that's when things start to change. You started to pay attention to your operating expenses. So you're really using budgeting, which is, which is, um, it, it's, it's a, a level outside of, of profit first, like profit first, the, the reason that profit first was, was invented and created is because, uh, it's to try to l allow you to still operate the way that you're, you know, innately 
um, you know, through human nature going to try to, to operate. So, uh, you know, you're the spender. If you have money in the bank, then your natural tendency is to want to spend it. So, um, ha you know, budgeting is kind of like dieting for you. So I think that I, I think that it would be it would be a good idea to set up that drip account so that you can uh, move that money to another account where you're not looking at it every day. You know, you're not looking and saying, oh, we have all that money in there. Do it. You know, is, do we really need to stick to this budget? Maybe we could go and spend this thing. So. You know that it'll remove that tug of war that that might be going on behind the scenes in your you know deep in your psyche um, that you're not even realizing because it's new right now. Like I could diet for two quarters, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's when I'm dieting for a year, a year and a half that, that you know yeah. the resolve gets tested. It's it's actually it doesn't have to take a year. I, probably two quarters is about is about where the resolve gets gets thoroughly tested when you know when I'm dieting. So it's the same thing. It's you, you can, you can change your behavior temporarily. Uh, but ultimately it's often it, it, you're going to go back to your roots, back to, to what you, what is natural for you. So I, you know, I, I, I think even though it's working, um, and this is just some advice I'm giving you here live on the, on the show, but you know, while it's working, uh, you know, figure out how to navigate the, the drip account and add it. Uh, you don't need to be an advanced user, uh, it's just another bank account and you just have to kind of like look at the last 12 months and say, okay, how, what was the lowest revenue month that I've had and what do I need the revenue to be at to be comfortable that month? And that's where you want to get the balance of the drip account to over time. Awesome. All right. So this, uh, this is all really, really interesting stuff. And I'm wondering like now that profit first is implemented, it's made, it's, it's woken you up. You've, you've decreased your operating expenses. What's next for your firm? Like, have you set your sights on a specific goal of, of where you want to go with the firm? Um, you know, what's in store for you now that you've got this all straightened out and, and things are, are, are running smoothly with, you know, with, cash in the bank? Yeah. So that's, that's a great question. And, and one that we're still uh, working out and trying to, to figure out. Um, and one of the things that I, I want to start focusing on now that we've got some consistency, more consistency in the, in the finances is expanding, uh, taking on some additional practice areas that are um, inside the injury disability umbrella. Uh, there's some things that I, that we don't do that I would like to start doing, but I think to do that would be the next, next step would be a hire. And I don't think that we're necessarily ready for that right now, but it's something that uh, we're looking forward to doing probably in the next six to 12 months uh, just to figure out what practice area we want to add uh, and then who, who we can bring in to, uh, to satisfy that. So I think, you know, Dave Ramsey says you grow, grow at the speed of cash. Um, so I, I'm really trying to take that into uh, account and make sure that before we get to the point where we are talking about hiring someone, um, we, our monthly revenue, our average monthly revenue is to a point where we can sustain that salary already without having to bring any, in, in any money from that additional practice area or from that person. Uh, so that's going to be a, a kind of a difficult task to, um, to undertake, but I think that would be the next step for us. Yeah, I, I think there's another way that you can approach that, and that is to just create yet another account where you start to save that rainy day fund that's just intended to cover the salary of the person you're bringing on. Mm -hmm. So rather than needing to get the revenue to be consistently at a certain point, because you're ignoring the fact that when I bring somebody on and they're able to handle these cases, they're going to start generating their own revenue and that's going to happen pretty quickly, right? It's not, you're not going to, if, if you're taking on something that you're already getting into your firm, you just can't service that right now. Um, you know, then it's just a matter of, okay, we put somebody in and, and they're ready to go. And now we start saying yes to this, to this option. Um, then, you know, they're going to, they're going to be revenue generating. So it's just a question of, okay, how, how many months cushion do we want? We want three months cushion. We want four months cushion, whatever it is, put that into that, into that account, whether you want to call it a vault account or just name it the, my next hire account, whatever you want to call it, but just, you know, and, and save that there. I think that'll give you, get, get you to that process of being ready to hire them faster than, than looking at your consistent revenue over time uh, because you're trying to get your firm to be a producer of 
three three attorney salaries on two attorneys work which you could do but it's you know that's going to take you um a significant amount of time to do and i think you're making more work for yourself than necessary um before bringing on uh, your next hire the, the truth is is the only reason i'm even having the conversation in these lines is because you're following the dave ramsey plan you're not going to take on debt you're going to do this this way the the reality is that most uh business owners wait too long to make that hire and even then even having you know having that money in the bank is probably waiting too long because it's the, the 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 it's the chicken or the egg you know which came first you typically need to make your hire for the revenue to go up and you know and, and firm owners and business owners in general are always like okay I, when i could get the revenue high enough that's when i'll bring somebody on and at that point it's way too late i mean you're you're already so stressed you're dropping things you're missing things your your, your customer service has, has declined um just in the name of trying to get to the point where we can now afford to bring somebody in um and that's that's what happens uh typically when you're you know whether you're doing it strategically or you're afraid to cut your, your salary to bring somebody else on. Um, so uh, recognize really having a plan of where is that work going to come from is, is the most important thing because if you're bringing somebody on with expertise in that area, they don't need to learn how to, you know, they need to learn your mission, your, you know, how you operate your core values, but they don't need to learn how to do their work. They're coming They're You know, they're hitting the ground running with doing their work. So if you if you know where that business is going to come from, then you know you're 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 pretty golden, pretty 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 set to go. Um, and you guys have figured out how, to, as he says, live on rice and beans before. So uh, yeah, we've you know, done that. If, <laughs> if, you, if you need if you if you need it even to de to to dip into your own salary to 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 cross the bridge for a few months, you probably could do that easily, um, and and it wouldn't you know it wouldn't hurt any. Uh, so, yeah, so, so I feel like we're in a, a bit of a sweet spot right now where, where we've got um, enough work to uh, satisfy where we are now, but uh, I, we don't have that extra um, caseload to give to someone right now. So I think that we still have a little bit of work to do to increase the intakes uh, to the point where we can, we can get that um, person work to do, uh, particularly in a new practice area that we haven't uh, been serving so far. Now, we're not we're not getting too many calls outside of our practice areas, but you know, the ones that we get are generally former clients calling us for estate planning and stuff, and we just refer those out to estate planners because we don't do that type of work. Um, mm -hmm. But if we were to, for example, add Social Security disability, which we don't do now, uh, we may have gotten a handful of those calls in the past six months, but not certainly enough to hire someone to satisfy that practice area. So I think we've got um, a little bit of, of work uh, to figure out how we'll start getting those cases um, and then how we're going to uh, hire someone to satisfy the, that, that demand. Yeah, but yeah I, I think I think it's a, a, a great idea. And I hadn't thought about doing that, just saving up the first four or five, six months of the person's salary in a separate account. Um, and then just go ahead and, and you know, flip in that switch uh, and then see what happens. Uh, that's a, certainly a thing that we'll, we'll think about and consider. Yeah. And the other thing to consider is you don't have to hire somebody full time in order to make this work. Right. So the real thing that you need to navigate is can we make the phone ring for this new thing? Let's say your Social Security disability is what we're what we're talking about. You know, how do we get Social Security disability cases? Maybe it looks a little bit different than how we get our current PI caseload. So. Uh, there's a marketing switch that needs to happen. There's an, an effort that needs to be made to try to bring those those cases in. And um, that's going to require testing and you need a runway for that. So another way that you can do this is you can find somebody who's got the skills that is interested in doing part time work, is interested in doing the cases as they come. And you're just paying them for the work that they're doing. Or uh, there's a, a company called Law Clerk, um, 
that uh, sponsored the Law Firm Growth Summit back in December, and they marry firms who have a specific need with um, attorneys who are able to freelance with a specific skill set. Um, and you can just go into their marketplace and find somebody and just start to give the work to somebody that way. Now, that person might turn into your full-time person when you're ready to hire them, but at least it'll allow you to work through the cases without you and your wife needing to learn another practice area yourselves mm -hmm. to be able to handle that work. So it's another another way to do it where you're you're removing the risk, right? So you're you're the marketing piece is the biggest risk of of the equation. I need to figure out that I could bring these cases in. So if you have if you if you work that system out and have a solution of how to get the clients you do find through the you know th work through and and resolved um, in a way that doesn't require you to bring on a full time person, you know then that gives you the, the runway you need to to have a system where you now you know now you've got the the ability to to keep making that phone ring and and the person hits the ground running once they become a full time hire. All right, so when you went to um, implement profit first, what were what were some challenges that you had, or or some some pushback that you that you know that just felt awkward, weird, you, you know, um, that you had to overcome in that process? Um, you know, I think it was it was difficult uh, to essentially cut down the amount of revenue that was coming in um, that goes into the operating account. Um, I think, so when I first started, I didn't start off with the, the target allocated percentages that um, are suggested in, in the book. Of course, you know, he talks about starting small and making in incremental changes. And I, I kind of, I kind of did that and I kind of jumped in with both feet. So I kind of did like a mixture between the two. I didn't start off mm -hmm. at the 1% like he suggested, uh, but also didn't start off at the 15%. Um, that's in the target allocated percentages. Um, so one of the hard thing was hardest things was thinking of the revenue coming in and thinking how much of that is actually going to pay my expenses. So if it costs me $20,000 a month to run my firm, I have to bring in $40,000 a month. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and every time I, I see a case, you know, if I settle a hundred thousand dollar case, the fee is $33,333 and 33 cents. When I look at that, I think, oh, wow, only $16,666.67 is going into my operating account. Um, right. it's a, that was a big mind shift uh, change for me. I used to think, well, $100,000 case, $33,000 fee, that pays, the, that pays the expenses for the month. We're good to go. Um, but now I, I, I think every single time I think of a fee, what a fee will be, I think, well, only half of that goes to pay my expenses. So we got to keep the pedal to the metal. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's the whole, um, the monthly nut mentality. You know, it's the, it's the traditional uh, revenue minus expenses equal profit, but the mind shift change from uh, revenue minus profit equals expenses um, has been probably the most difficult for me. Uh, and just to force myself to sit down on the first and the 15th of every month and, and make those transfers um, based on those percentages that I've already determined. Because um, it's easy to look at the, the month and think, uh, well, I'm only gonna, I need this much, so I'm gonna change my percentages based on what's gonna happen. Um, but what I've had to tell myself is, if I don't have the money to pay that bill uh, because I haven't brought in the money this month, um, then that's my business telling me that I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to look at the expenses a lot differently and look at the revenue a lot differently. Uh, so that's why I really got into um, the expenses and, and cut them down dramatically um, because I realized that my business was essentially telling me that I can't afford all those extra things. Um, and then I made adjustments accordingly. Uh, but now I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get back into the, the place where I, I want to start adding some of those things back in. Um, so that's, it's kind of that tug of war, uh, that I think, like you said earlier, that drip account might help, um, to keep me from doing that, that natural temptation to add, 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 uh, when things are going well, because when things are going well now, but in a, you know, in a contingency practice, you can ha easily have a couple months where cases that you expect to settle, don't settle. Um, yep. and you can schedule trials, uh, all you want. And right now all, all of our trials are, trials are being continued. 
Uh, we've had a couple already that have been continued because the courts have essentially shut down in uh, personal injury cases are, are not essential. They're not emergency cases. Only those emergency cases are being heard right now. Um, and I just can't imagine a scenario at, at this point in the middle of this coronavirus pandemic that um, you can put a jury in a box and then send them back into a room to deliberate. It, it's too, too close to quarters for that sort of thing. And I really don't have any idea when we're going to get back um, to doing that. But if we don't try cases and we don't make money, um, so that's a, a difficult rub right now also. Um, so just making sure that we're having that, that constant um, pressure on the expenses, keeping the expenses down, but at the same time, backing that up every single month, thinking how much do I need to bring in? I essentially have to double my expenses to figure out exactly what I need to bring in. Yeah, and and I, I love that um, the way that you get to think about it now is, is when you're starting to question, okay, I want to bring that expense back. Now you got to look at it and say, okay, so how much do I need to increase my revenue to make that happen? How many more cases do I need to have monthly in order for this to be able to be something I can afford? And it gives you a totally different perspective of how to look at it. And one of the things that uh, I focus on with my clients uh, when I'm helping guide them on on getting to their goals is that you need to have a very clear plan of, of what you're looking for, what you want, um, and and create a plan of how to get there. And I think that what's happened in the last three quarters for you is that this opened your eyes, this, re this, re this realization of, oh, I'm not just trying to cover the bills. I actually need to have double that in order for this to be a healthy business, it changed your perspective of how many cases you needed to be in a good place. And I think that it sounds like that was a, a driver of revenue for you that, you know, it, yep. it, it, it just whipped you into shape saying, Hey, we need to go and get more business. And, um, it's an eye opener to see that you're in full control of that. Right. You, right. It's all tied to your effort, you know, and, and we, what happens is, is that, you know, we we take the pedal off the metal, like you said, you know, we, we, we throttle back because, oh, I achieved what I needed to achieve. I got my case. I got my case this month. I'm good. I don't have to push again till next month. But the reality is, is no, you needed two cases. You had it wrong. So you figured that out. And I think that um, moving forward, you know, as as you look to grow, start, you know, pay attention to that, like recognize that you have that ability, you have that power. And if you just simply make a decision of this is something I really want in order to get there, it's going to require that we get this to this level of achievement. Now I need to I need to focus on that. And, you know, the ability to be able to do that is completely um, up to you. It's not, you know, it, it doesn't the world around you doesn't happen uh, just, you know, just because it's happening. It's happening for you and you have complete control over, you know, over what, um, you know, what comes just from your efforts. Uh, so I love that that you're, you've seen that lesson along the way. Uh, it, people have a very hard time wrapping their heads around that, and you know, and sometimes they'll you know they'll spend a lot of years trying to figure out how to navigate this business thing, um, not getting it because they just haven't believed that all well, they have to do is is really decide that this is what I want. Um, so. Yeah. Any, so let me ask you this is we're, we're at the top of the hour. We're going to, we're going to wrap this up. I would love it if you can, you know, leave our listeners with, uh, you know, one parting piece of advice, one, you know, something that you've uh, from your experience that if they were to do this today, that would be, you know, life changing for them. Yeah, I think, um, you know, just speaking from my experience and, and what I understand uh, from the profit first book, you know, if you're, if you start small, if you, if you create these small incremental changes in your finances, you can use this system and ultimately you build it up to the point where your business is serving you, not the other way around. Um, but Mike Mahalowitz, Mikhailowitz, um, talks about if you can put 1% in your profit account, if you just start small and start with 1%, uh, your business can run on 99% of the revenue. If your business can't run on 99% of the revenue, you have other problems um, and you need to get into your, into your expenses a lot more. 
Um, but if you can just start with 1% and then build it up, push it up to 5% maybe the next quarter, then maybe up to 10% the next quarter, whatever your percentages look like, eventually you're going to get to the point where the profit first system 100% works for you. And I think it's even more important in a contingency fee practice because when my experience is, you know, if I hit a big case, I want to go do a big thing. I want to buy something big. I want, but that's not the mentality that we should have. That money should go into that profit account and then take it from your profit account into another um, profit hold account at a completely different bank and then pay yourself every quarter and then go do something fun every quarter. But you got to keep the pedal up to the metal every single day, every single month uh, of every single quarter if you're going to keep uh, creating that sustained uh, revenue and that sustained growth. And that was, I think, one of my problems was how do I sustain this and, and how do I know when to pay myself extra profit. I, I know the traditional formula of profit, but uh, when do I actually take that money out of a business when that business has only been around for three years? Um, and that's just a difficult question to answer. Uh, but profit first answers that question for you. So start small and follow the system, trust the system. It works. Um, you just have to get it to where you're, you're operating on full throttle. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I love um, the way that you've implemented it, the lessons that you've learned. Uh, it's just a, a shining example of, of where the system works. And, and, and folks, if, if you don't resonate with the profit first system, if it doesn't work for you, then don't implement it, but come up with another system. Find something that does work for you. Uh, you know, not every answer is the answer for you. Um, but the, if you look at the lessons learned here in this episode, if you look at what's happening, what's happening is, is that Brandon's paying attention. Brandon doesn't want instant gratification. He recognizes that sometimes you need to delay your satisfaction in order to achieve a result. I mean, just look at his journey with, you know, implementing Dave Ramsey and, and, and cutting down on their personal living habits, their lifestyle, and getting rid of all their debt, um, working their way through that. Uh, then in the firm, implementing profit first, now moving the profit to a holding account where you're only going to get it once a quarter. You're not just writing yourself a check every time that there's extra money in the account. Uh, that that teaches teaches you this delayed gratification. People, you know, we're, we're in a society where we want things now. We want things instantly. Um, instant gratification is a big thing. I mean, we've got Amazon. We've got Netflix. We've got, you know, like you don't even need to leave your house and you can get the latest movie and you can, uh, it, you know, uh, have have your, your shopping delivered to your door. Uh, so we're in that mindset of things happen for me instantly. And when it comes to business, when it comes to growing your business, when it comes to fixing a problem that you have, those things don't happen overnight. And the more that you realize that this is going to be a thing that, t that takes time and it's going to require that you have patience, um, that's what's going to be uh, what allows you to, to fix it. Uh, so, Brandon, thank you so much for being here with us. How could people follow up with you if they wanted to reach out to you directly, uh, whether it's to uh, send a PI case your way and, and uh, make sure to let us know where you're located. I, didn't, I don't think I covered that at the beginning. Um, and, uh, or if they want to ask you questions about Profit First. Yeah, absolutely. So we are in uh, Central Virginia in the Lynchburg, Greater Lynchburg area, um, which is a couple hours west of Richmond, Virginia, our capital. Um, and you can find me on the internet, www.osterbeinlaw.com. Um, you can find us on Facebook, we're on Twitter, um, Instagram, all of the above. We do all the social media things. Uh, I also just started a, uh, a podcast in some of my free time uh, talking about injury and disabilities uh, information. Uh, it's called Insight to Injury. It's on Apple Podcasts. Uh, and all the other uh, podcasting services that I'm pretty excited about. We are four episodes in. Uh, so if you would go and take a listen to that, I would appreciate it. Uh, we also have started a couple of fun things on our website. We started a book club. Uh, we, my team reads books every month together. So and a lot of people ask us about what books we're reading and why we're reading them and what we learn from them. So I decided to just loop people in on that. If you want to go to our website and sign up for that, you can get the email every month and we'll, uh, do a, a book club type virtual meeting, uh, which is going to be fun. So uh, a lot of fun things that we're doing and uh, try to provide more information and more value to people in our community. 
That's awesome. Uh, so I, book club is something that we've been toying with here um, at Profit with Law for a while. Uh, as a matter of fact, during our live Q and A's the, um, at night during the Law Firm Growth Summit, I ran a poll every night to say. Uh, the question was, uh, if I were to start a book club, would you be interested in joining it? And would you believe it that the response rate was 99% yes every single night, five days in a row? Um, and the only reason we haven't started is just because we have enough projects on the table that <laughs> <laughs> we just haven't had the bandwidth to start another one. But uh, it's definitely something that we we want to do as well. Uh, I'm an avid reader, a voracious reader. I you know uh, I read, I listen. Um, and uh, a lot of my knowledge came from from my reading. It, I understand the power of reading. When I take on new uh, coaching clients, uh, one of the things that I do is I, sh I ship them a package with books in it, uh, you know, and, and you know, very specific books that I've chosen to help them through the journey when we're working together. Uh, and I, you know, I I think it's just the, the amount of, of information out there that's you know, that's helpful for running a business, improving your personal life uh, is just amazing. So I love that you're doing that. And we'll, uh, folks, we'll link all this stuff up in the show notes. So it'll be right below the episode in, in your podcast player, hopefully. But if not, you go to profitwithlaw.com forward slash number of the episode. Uh, again, I, I uh, as I'm recording this, I'm not sure what number it's going to be. So I can't give you the, the exact URL, but um, it's always profitwithlaw.com forward slash. And then, you know, for example, example 091 came out today so that would be 091 uh this one will be uh, prob probably in and close to the hundreds if not in the hundreds um Brandon, thank you so much for, for joining us and for your uh, uh, honesty, uh, authenticity here with sharing, you know, talking about the financials of your firm are not always a, uh, an easy thing to talk about. So, um, you know, I appreciate you being willing to come on and, and have that conversation. And I'm sure that there are people who are listening to this that um, have had their lives changed today. You know, we don't know it yet. And they don't know it yet, uh, but they're going to take action based on something that you shared. And, uh, you know, six months from now, we're going to find out that, you know, somebody's in, in a very uh, great position with their firm because of that episode that they listened to with Brandon and Moshe. So, um, you know, I appreciate you coming here and, and doing that for that person uh, or group of people. But uh, this is a topic that we need to talk about more. And, you know, so I love that we had the opportunity to do that. Um, I also have just found out that you're on all these different social media platforms and you're also start started a podcast. So we have to have you back to have a talk about marketing. Uh, you know, how are you, how are you navigating doing all that and running a law firm? Uh, so, uh, maybe, maybe we'll get you back for another episode where we can talk about that. And, you know, as the law firm owner, um, uh, you know, you had said that you got on social media years ago when people weren't, you know, weren't really on there yet. Uh, so I'd love to dive into that topic at some point. Um, you know, when you have time. <laughs> yeah, of course. All right, folks, we'll catch you on uh, our next solo episode, which comes out on Tuesdays. We're here every Tuesday and Thursday. Thank you so much for tuning in. And if you're listening to the show for the first time, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you get notified the next time one of our episodes goes live. That's it for this week's episode of Profit With Law. If you have enjoyed the show, please consider sharing it with at least one person. Imagine how many lives we can change if we each shared this episode. Another way to share the episode is on social media. We appreciate your support and look forward to you joining us again next week.